are just just joining. So I'm going to give it just one more minute for a few more people to join before um, I introduce our speaker. <clears throat> Okay. All right. All right. We have a whole bunch of people joining. So welcome. Um, I hope everyone has had a great summer. We are resuming our psych monthly psychology grand rounds. Uh, and today we have the privilege of hearing from one of our own faculty, Dr. Shannon O'Neill, who's going to be talking to us about her work um, using accelerated ERP and TMS for treatment resistant OCD treatment. Um, so a little bit about our speaker. So Dr. O'Neill joined the Center for Advanced Circuit Therapeutics at Mount Sinai West in 2019. Um, within her CIEC position, she provides pre and post-surgical psychological evaluations and ongoing psychotherapy to patients undergoing neuromodulation. Primary diagnoses treated within this role include neurological movement disorders, OCD, Tourette syndrome, and major depressive disorder. And through previous experience within Sinai's Obsessive Compulsive and Related Disorders Program, uh, Dr. O'Neill has in-depth knowledge in, of exposure and response prevention, um, or ERP, and treats treatment refractory OCD patients pursuing deep brain stimulation, um, or TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation for symptom relief. Um, on a personal note, I'm, you know, I was just telling Dr. O'Neill, I'm really excited that she has offered to give us this lecture today. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with Dr. O'Neill um, during her tenure at Sinai, and I'm always amazed by her ability to do this magic behind closed doors and provide this really specialized care to patients who, you know, really, you know, need the relief. And so she's so compassionate and she's so effective, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to what she has to say today. So um, that said, Dr. O'Neill, the floor is all yours. Awesome. Thank you so much. And thank you for that introduction. Let me work on sharing my screen for one moment. Okay. All right. Hopefully everyone sees that okay. Um, thank you, Dr. Paul Macy. I was I you took the words out of my mouth. I was just going to say um I've really enjoyed working with Dr. Paul Macy, and we're actually on the same team for individuals pursuing DBS um or deep brain stimulation and other neuromodulation treatments. So Hi, everyone. As mentioned, I am Dr. O'Neill, and within my role, I work with patients who are deemed treatment refractory and, and in need of a higher level of care at the neurocircuitry level. And so many patients come to my initial evaluation having tried and exhausted traditional psychotherapy approaches with, without much response or ability to maintain initial gains. And so naturally these individuals, when they show up at my appointment, they will ask, um, or they will they will conclude that psychological intervention doesn't really have a space in their future treatment plan. They've been there and done that, hasn't really worked. This phenomenon led to first a question of mine of, do I have a role here? Um, is there space for me in this group? And um, how can I be effective? I began to ask the research question, can these evidence-based psychotherapies still have a role and be deemed beneficial while patients pursue neuromodulation services, such as TMS for treatment, re um, treatment resistant OCD? So today I'm gonna share some preliminary findings with you. But first, I'd like to start with just talking about some quick objectives for today's discussion. My hope is to demonstrate an understanding of rationale for ERP and the accelerated treatment of TMS for OCD, learn how to accurately develop an accelerated week of exposure along a customized fear hierarchy, and then also have the knowledge to access supplemental therapeutic frameworks that can also be effective for patients with OCD outside of traditional CBT and ERP. I know we have several competent individuals online and you are all very familiar with the diagnosis uh, and the DSM. However, I think it might be helpful to just briefly go through the diagnosis because it further illustrates a rationale for the treatment. The DSM states OCD is the presence of an obsession, compulsion, or both. And obsessions are defined as recurrent and persistent thoughts, images, 
impulses, urges that are experienced as unwanted and quite intrusive. These are certainly not in invited in by the patient. They are quite intrusive. And when an individual begins to experience the unwanted thought, there are countless attempts to either ignore, suppress, neutralize the experience, which often leads to compulsion. So compulsions, which are also known as rituals, these are repetitive behaviors or also mental acts that the individual feels compelled to perform. And the set of rules, whether they're logical or illogical, they aim to reduce anxiety. So this is a psychoeducational graph that I will often review with patients in the first session or two. At the top, you see that either an internal or external trigger will result in the development of an intrusive thought or also known as obsessions. And this obsession begins to be misinterpreted as quite meaningful and something that should be paid attention to. I will often really normalize with patients that everyone has intrusive thoughts. And the difference between general population versus individuals who begin to develop OCD is that um, the general population doesn't typically attach meaning um, to the intrusive thought. They, they find it weird, they kind of shrug it off and they move along. Um, however, for individuals with OCD, there's misinterpretation and it actually increases emotional and physiological distress and in an effort to reduce that surge of anxiety, the individual will engage in rituals, avoidance, um, to neutralize symptoms quickly. So this short-term relief reinforces the cycle, and it starts to illustrate to the body that each time an obsession occurs, a ritual should be completed to manage the anxiety. So the ritual, of course, is seen as a solution or a way out, and it is in the short term. However, unfortunately, the problem with rituals is that they are definitely not long-term solutions. They take a lot of time and energy, which, of course, interferes with life and just quality of life. And then over time, it often takes more and more rituals to alleviate the distress. So it really builds upon itself. What CBT and ERP offer is a break in a few of these links across the cycle. So with cognitive restructuring, you see that first, um, that first X, that red X. Cognitive restructuring, this can assist in reducing just the misappraisal attached to the original thought. And then exposure can begin to teach the body to habituate and reduce anxiety independent of the ritual. Um, so it's not necessarily to block the individual from feeling the experience or the, the distress, but from carrying out an activity to neutralize that distress. Today, we're primarily focused on ERP. And so let's expand on what ERP is. It is It stands for Exposure and Response Pre Prevention. It is the first line of evidence-based psychotherapy treatment for non-refractory OCD. And of course, OCD intensity and duration can um, influence outcome of ERP efficacy. So higher initial symptom severity as well as comorbid depression can predict poor ERP outcomes. All the more reason it may be beneficial to augment with neuromodulation treatment, um, such as TMS being one of them. And I will say that the patient population that is seen within our clinic are typically individuals with longer courses of symptoms. Initially, um, symptom severity is very, very high and naturally some comorbid depression with it. The goal of exposure is to come into contact with feared stimuli, heightening the anxiety and leaning into it further with symptom provocation with no artificial reduction of symptoms. So this includes um, no rituals, no cognitive restructuring, no relaxation, no coping strategies, even if healthy. Um, it's really, really important to not use breathing techniques, mantras, cognitive restructuring when engaging in traditional exposure, because this continues to illustrate to the body um, these symptoms are threatening, threatening, they need manipulated away, um, even if it's healthy. And in fact, one of the 25 successful tips for OCD um, will say, 
in order to feel relief, you have to experience the anxiety. So we don't want it reduced in any way, even if healthy. Um, if the exposure is too challenging, there are plenty of other ways to modify the exposure to more of an intermediate level without incorporating safety techniques. So for example, rather than touching a doorknob, let's say with your bare hands, they may start with a degree of separation. So um, if they need it at an intermediate level and we're going to prevent deep breathing and relaxation to reduce their physiological distress, we could encourage, let's put a barrier in between. So it's one degree of separation. So you're touching the doorknob, but it's with a paper towel in between the hand and the doorknob. If that's still spiking their distress, um, that could be inching closer towards direct contact. And during the implementation, you should collect their subjective units of distress before, during, and after the exposure. I'll certainly introduce SUDS at later in the discussion when we're building, um, talking about a case study. Um, the exposure should be prolonged, repetitive, and modeled by the provider. I really want to emphasize that it's important um, as a provider, you feel you feel comfortable being exposed to the same stimuli. Um, you are going to be modeling the exposure for the individual before they engage in the exposure themselves. Um, what's great about exposure, if you do have any um, any difficulty, let's say with, I mean, if we're gonna stay with contamination, the great news is you habituation works. So it works for you alongside the patient if you are working on something as well. Um, and then debriefing is always important and something that can be overlooked or skipped over quickly. Um, it's important post exposure to assist in shaping cognitive modification. When offering psychoeducation about ERP, I use the analogy of water depth and temperature. So I'll inform the patient that along a fear hierarchy, we will first start small, such as just entering the shallow end of the pool, and we'll begin to walk our way or work our, ourselves up towards more challenging exposures, just like walking towards the deep end of the pool. And initially, when we go to temperature, just like entering a pool, the temperature may be very shocking at first, just like your SUDS rating or your subjective units of distress might really spike initially. The longer you stay engaged without jumping out of a pool, your body gets used to the experience. That is the same hope for habituation to anxious distress, staying in the exposure for a prolonged period of time. And here is a graph illustrating the same content. You can see anxiety is on the Y axis and time is on the X axis. Um, everyone knows this when they work with any anxiety disorder. I'm sure you've shown the same graph before. When anxiety initially escalates, some believe it will be experienced forever unless they do something about it. They have to intervene, whether it be a ritual, avoidance, um, fleeing the scene. However, exposure showcases that anxiety will eventually peak within the body on its own. And then over time with repetition, the peak lessens, as you see here, and the reduction is also faster until the stimuli eventually is no longer paired with anxiety. So when we think of ERP theory, the early theory of ERP, it suggested that habituation to one's heightened physiological response was a necessary prerequisite to produce cognitive shifts or a long-term fear reduction. However, current research has actually discovered that physiological habituation and fear reduction within exposure is not predictive of overall outcomes. In fact, although I, I always hope for habituation to assist with fear reduction, other targeted goals include distress tolerance, cognitive modification, and the hope is that self-efficacy through exposure completion this can lead to critical learning experiences, cognitive modification, all of that can take place. So in summary, ERP is meant to break two types of associations. First, the aim is to break the connection between anxiety and things that produce this anxiety. And the second, ERP breaks the connection between carrying out rituals and relief. 
Within the accelerated week of TMS, I go for two types of exposures that are often completed in vivo and imaginal. In vivo exposure entails directly confronting feared stimuli in real life. And when engaging in in vivo exposures, it's important to promote uncertainty and prevent undoing. So many of my patients might think, okay, this is okay to complete this exposure because my therapist is assigning it to me and they know nothing will happen, so I'm safe. But that's actually not true. And um, I will also express that. So it, for example, I can't guarantee that someone won't get sick by touching a doorknob. And I make sure to express that uncertainty if it feels as though it is a coping strategy or a ritual of soothing themselves that this is artificial, everything's okay. And if I start to notice that the patient prefers I assign the exposure to them, which can be a safety technique in its own type of ritual, um, feeling as though there's some artificial protection there, um, that is a good signal that they should start um, generating their own exposures um, and being held responsible for their exposure. So a simple example of an in vivo exposure would be contamination. So while touching an object deemed contaminated, the instruction for the patient could be saying something to themselves like, I may or may not get sick. This will impact my overall health. And within that statement, you're targeting two separate things. You're promoting uncertainty, I may or may not get sick, and an overall feared consequence, which I'll elaborate on later. But for here, the overall feared consequence is my overall health is going to be impacted. And just like I mentioned before, preventing undoing, we don't want, for, for the sake of this example, we wouldn't want the exposure to be simply hand washed away. So in order to prevent undoing through a simple hand wash, the patient could then be instructed to cross-contaminate to their clothing um, that they'll enter their home with and hopefully cross-contaminate to their other furniture. And so it really prevents walking out of the office, going to the sink and just washing away the exposure. Imaginal exposures are typically at the top of someone's hierarchy because these are, these are often worst case scenarios and there's something that can't be replicated in real life or in vivo. Um, they should be, imaginal exposures, these should be written as detailed as possible in first person using present tense, all the senses, making it a very vivid scene. And then following the written account of an imaginal exposure, it can be either audio recorded, it could be listened to on a loop, and this assists with repetition and just the prolongedness of what we want the patient to sit through. Okay. That was a quick crash course on ERP. I'd like to briefly transition and introduce TMS. So how does TMS work? There is a circuitry within our brain known as the CSTC loop circuit. This stands for the cortical striatal thalamic cortical loop. And this circuitry projects from the cortex to the striatum, from the striatum to the thalamus, and then back to the cortex. There is substantial evidence suggesting that OCD involves functional and also structural abnormalities in the limbic CSTC loop. And these structures are often found to be hyperactivated in OCD patients, not only during rest, but further hyperactivated after symptom provocation. So TMS targets a specific location of the CSTC loop. And after successful treatment, the activity along this loop circuit has shown to decrease. It's no longer misfiring. A traditional course of care is a six week protocol for TMS. This is made up of 36 sessions total. And 30 sessions are administered on a daily basis, Monday through Friday. And then the remaining six sessions are administered two to three times weekly. Our TMS team refers to this as the taper down period, and this is where patients are beginning to adjust to what life might be like after TMS and space in between those sessions. So here they come to Mount Sinai West to our TMS clinic 36 separate times, which is a big, big commitment for these patients. And the treatment and all treatments um, deemed successful if the patient's OCD symptom severity score, also known as the Y box, reduces by 35% or more. 
something really special and unique about our TMS team is the incorporation of an fMRI before accelerated treatment. And this is so that we can use a neuro navigation system for more precise and individualized targeting during treatment. So following the fMRI, our engineered team will take the scan information and process it so that we can input our data into the neuro navigation system and locate a patient specific OFC target, which is the orbital frontal cortex. And this protocol is very routine for our patients with OCD who are pursuing deep brain stimulation, which helps guide the neurosurgeon to find the exact target for a lead placement and stimulation of a DBS device. We are now replicating that procedure in accelerated TMS to be even more precise with external stimulation. And from what we know through literature so far, our team at Mount Sinai West is actually conducting the first reported use of this tractography in psychiatric TMS. <coughs> Excuse me. So here's an image of the TMS room at Mount Sinai West with, you see the neuro navigation machine is this long crane on the right. And then the patient sitting in this chair and then the computer screen right next to them. I have a video that I'd like to show of just a few seconds of um, the target. Um, and this is a video of a TMS session targeting the OFC through the precise neuro navigation system. Okay, not, <laughs> not much to the video. What I like about this video is that when you see the setup of the individuals within this chair, <laughs> so many individuals will just want to know so much about what they're experiencing and be involved as possible. They're very strongly uh, information gatherers. And so for them to have to see the intervention in real time on the screen and seeing their specific target and their brain structure, um, found by the team, I think that, that that is really cool and reinforces just a lot of confidence and rapport um, with the patient as they're receiving treatment from us. So really cool in real time um, intervention. Okay, now that I've introduced both ERP and TMS, I'd like to discuss just if there's any information about coupling these services, no surprise, there's very little research. Um, research has informed us that accelerated ERP and TMS have shown to be successful independent of one another. There is also one study that combined ERP with TMS. However, it was across a traditional six-week course of, of care with provocation to the feared stimuli. It was only completed during the TMS dose without any ERP instructions between TMS sessions. So, it was during the stimulation, 36 separate times, no assignment of homework or action plans in between. Until our model at Mount Sinai West, it really remained unknown if the augmentation of ERP with TMS could offer further symptom reduction at an accelerated rate, meaning five days of services, which I'll, I'll highlight and, and show how we outline it, rather than 36 days. So that leads to our team's application, both of TMS and ERP for OCD. Measures collected at baseline and post-accelerated week include the Y-box, um, which again is an OCD symptom severity measure, the BDI and the BAI. My work as the ERP provider begins a few weeks prior to the accel accelerated course, I tend to focus on collecting a very clear OCD presentation through symptom monitoring, and then also begin developing a personalized fear hierarchy for these individuals. This is really essential so that the patient has an exposure treatment plan prepared for the week of stimulation. They show up and we're ready to go, we know the plan, and they've been on board and, and, and working alongside me. The breakdown of treatment entails eight hours a day of ERP, as well as nightly action plans for additional exposure outside of the office. And then TMS entails 10 sessions per day, which are scheduled on the hour, and they last roughly 90 seconds each time. So apart from individual hourly ERP work, 
Symptom provocation is also performed before each TMS treatment to activate the, the relevant brain circuit. And it's continued to be promoted throughout the 90 seconds of stimulation. So this could be including touching or viewing content that is classified by the patient as feared stimuli. Here's an example of the five-day course of treatment. You can see that TMS is scheduled on the hour and ERP is ongoing in between throughout the day. And here's an example of the schedule emailed to the patients ahead of time. Although very redundant, I like showing this because it, it shows the, the remarkability of these individuals and what they're willing to sign up for. It shows just the intensity of the week um, and what these individuals are, are committing to. Okay, so I'd like to go through a clinical vignette, and this can better depict some exposure completion within the accelerated week. One of the cases we worked with was a 38-year-old Jewish female with five young children, ages ranging from two to 14. Her OCD subtype entailed being preoccupied with personal responsibility of others' safety. So specifically, it was actually the physical safety and health of her, her children. Some intrusive thoughts that she possessed centered around the fear of fires, break-ins, drowning, choking, and rituals included checking household items, um, writing down mental notes of lessons learned, even if they were intuitive, and then also reassurance seeking um, with her husband. Reassurance seeking is a very subtle and discreet ritual, but a very strong ritual that is um, quite common with OCD. Um, just giving you some examples of the rituals. So for checking household items, OCD is known as the doubting disease. Um, she would hold her hand under the sink to make sure the faucet wasn't really running overnight. She couldn't simply glance at the sink and appreciate that the faucet was off. So fear of flood and a fire starting, she would hold her hand under the faucet to make sure it didn't get wet. When writing down mental notes of lessons learned, she would exit her bed and write down some very intuitive statements such as, remember to hold my daughter's hand when crossing the street. And then for reassurance seeking, um, it was her husband's duty to kind of close out the day, secure and lock the, the apartment and make sure everything was, um, all the entryways were, were locked up and safe. And regardless of how many times he had done this, each time he would come into the bedroom to, to enter bed, she would ask the same question. Um, did you check the locks? Um, and that would immediately reinforce the same obsession um, because that ritual quickly reduced her anxiety. An important side note, I mentioned this er earlier, it is really, really critical to identify a feared consequence associated with the obsession. So you know what you're targeting at the, at the highest level. So using Socratic questioning, I'll often explore what might occur if she doesn't complete her ritual. What would happen next? Her response included, my kids will be harmed and it'll be my fault. And that second part of the statement is so essential. Being held responsible was her biggest fear. So at the highest level, she feared being held responsible for something bad happening to her children. And she would often say, um, if I engage in reassurance seeking with my husband and he says it's fine, but then something would happen to my kids, it's no longer on me. So it felt less impactful. Um, if she doesn't verbalize it to someone else, which could be its own exposure of holding it in and not saying it to someone else, it would weigh on her that the responsibility was solely hers, and that was her biggest feared consequence. So her baseline Y-box score before the accelerated week was 35 out of 40 total points. And this is categorized as the highest level of severity, which is classified as extreme. And again, as I mentioned earlier, the work starts um, before the week of accelerated treatment, I will typically meet with the patient about two weeks before their scheduled TMS and offer education on symptom monitoring and also building a fear hierarchy. The patient is instructed to track their symptoms across two weeks in order to illustrate where OCD appears throughout their life. And before generating ideas for exposure, I will introduce the SUD scale, which stands for Subjective Units of Distress, 
patients will use personal experiences to identify an anchor at zero, five, and 10 along the sense scale. Zero being a relaxing experience they can recall, five being a moderate day-to-day -day level of distress when managing OCD, and then 10 being the worst anxiety they have experienced managing OCD. For this patient specifically, um, her zero uh, across her anchors being having a nice family dinner at home and everyone's accounted for and safe. Five was flammable objects near unplugged appliances. So this could be a roll of paper towels near an unplugged toaster. That was a five, more of her everyday contact. And then 10 being a time she forgot to close out the day with an extensive checking ritual for security of the home. And then using their anchors, patients have a better sense of how to rate future exposures when we're generating them together. Um, so sometimes people will come in and they'll say everything's a 10 um, or they won't know how to rate it first. And I'll say, is this, is this more or less distressing than um, your five? And then we'll go back to their anchor to really pinpoint where we can place this exposure. If individuals come and say everything is a 10, what is so great about the, the fear hierarchy and just generating exposures is you can be really, really flexible and collaborative with the patient. So there's variables that you can consider to make it more or less difficult. So things that might help to further expand the hierarchy so everything isn't an eight, nine, or 10 is the proximity near items. So for this individual, a piece of paper near her iPhone screen, which she believed would catch fire from the screen light and heat, um, inching that piece of paper closer each night as she slept on the nightstand. The proximity of the item could be um, a four versus, an, uh, let's say, a 10 with the phone face down on a piece of paper at night. The number of times rituals are completed, the amount of checking, and then for her, the length of writing when she's documenting her intuitive rules. Um, a lot of the things that we focused on is putting before elimination and trusting her instincts and her intuition. Um, we would say, let's try to write down one to two words and trust you know what you mean by this statement, rather than um, a very, very long narrative with multiple sentences. Okay, here's an example of the equipment or the props brought in for the accelerated week by this patient. Um, this patient brought a toaster, an empty pill bottle, noise machine, board games, baby monitor. She brought everything from her home that she deemed as unsafe. And then across the five days together, in vivo exposures targeted the following items you see here. Um, certainly not an exhaustive list. She also chose to stay at a, a hotel, which I find interesting, um, where these, this is where nightly assignments were also completed. Although there's several pros and cons to staying at a hotel, it was largely for logistical purposes. So the hotel allowed her to maintain focus on treatment away from the distraction of five children and a, and a very busy schedule and also proximity to Mount Sinai West, which is great. However, it also allowed her to practice more intermediate exposure before returning home, which is where harder exposure existed. So examples at the hotel included putting a tissue box under a lamp with the uncertainty of a fire starting, keeping an open pill bottle on the nightstand that she fears her, her daughter will stumble upon and ingest, um, keeping a hairdryer plugged in overnight. And to target home assignments and not ignore those, her spouse would also follow nightly instructions, such as um, one example was um, placing a cardboard box against their floor lights, um, again, with the uncertainty that a fire might start. And for the patient to instruct this of her husband was part of the exposure. And this really targeted, again, her feared consequence of being held responsible. It's not me calling her husband and informing him this is the exposure, she had to relay the information to him and then sleep separate from her family. So that was a very big exposure for her. I have a few photos to illustrate the work that was completed in the office. Well, this is actually at the hotel. So we would go off site from Mount Sinai and would also do in vivo exposures in the community. And this is an example of at the hotel, 
um, a closet light and inching fabric closer to the light um, with the fear of catching fire. Um, she was very um, triggered and, and unexpectedly that there was a light by the toilet. And so we placed like a tissue there against the light, touching it directly for the fire. Um, having snagged power outlets, which she typically goes, she has a big ceremony about um, checking into a hotel and like unplugging absolutely everything and only plugging it in for the moment she needs something. And then here's in my office of uh, just a recreation of an open pill bottle, her noise machine, um, her phone falling off of the nightstand, which she doesn't like um, cords being tugged. And then you can see we've really blossomed the, the tissues under the lamp to inch them closer to the bulb. And then she brought some choking hazards um, that she would, she would visualize or fear were scattered around her home for her kids. Okay, many often ask why the heck we would engage in exposures at the far end of a continuum when no normal individual would do some of these behaviors. For example, the general population would not leave a lamp on overnight with a scarf wrapped around it. You can see that that's one of the photos here. Um, however, pushing past normalcy allows the patient to really build their own confidence in doing everyday tasks that are much easier than the extreme. So they can remind themselves, I've gone to the extreme. If I can do that, I can simply um, keep a, a lamp plugged in and use it as necessary which is where we really hope to fall and land at the end. Okay, and within the 40 hours of treatment, there's a lot of additional dialogue used to work through OCD symptoms. I promise we're not doing a full 40 hours of just flooding with exposures. We're doing a lot of discussion, debriefing, cognitive shifts. And so some additional framework that I pull from include ACT, cognitive therapy, and DBT. As many of you probably know, um, acceptance and commitment therapy has really fantastic metaphors that illustrate the importance of coexisting with difficult internal experiences. And there's a metaphor called the unwelcome party guest, which highlights the importance of engaging in values while simultaneously balancing these difficult internal symptoms that arise at the same time. So rather than keeping watch, quote unquote, at the door of, let's say, a party, metaphorically, and blocking the unwelcome party guest, which is the anxiety. The hope is that the patient can begin to engage in moments that they truly care about while also simultaneously embracing that internal experience that shows up, whatever it is. So for an individual with OCD, it could be intrusive thoughts. And this clip art is a photo. If you do a quick YouTube search and type in the unwelcome party guest, there's like a three minute video of the metaphor. Um, and so what I'll often do with the patients is I print out this photo, his name is Brian in the video, um, and we carry him around on a stick. I know it sounds super cheesy, but um, that's often the feedback of the biggest takeaway when I continue to work with these patients, their shorthand for OCD is now Brian because they continue to say Brian shows up um, when I'm at my most special moments. And so we, it's a, just a good reminder and a symbolism of coexisting with something that you wish wasn't there, but it's not going to be the thing blocking you from what matters most. And similar to that, another aspect of the ACT framework includes values, which was a big target of the Accelerated Week as well. So we spent time identifying ways OCD has resulted in the patient just missing out or cutting corners within special moments. And this patient identified activities she would want to engage in or could re-engage in and recenter to what's important. So one example she offered was she wanted to have a movie night with her kids and finally include popcorn. They ask all the time and she always turns them down due to the fear of a choking hazard. And having that special moment with the kids is something that was very valuable to her and something she wanted to work towards, even if Brian was there at the same time. Regarding cognitive therapy, I incorporate a lot of disputation and thought challenging um, just to gain a clearer perspective of the rituals that are completed. I personally love what I have coined a billboard method. And this suggests 
there's no major advertisement. There's no major warnings against the fear that the patient has or any recalls. So for example, if it was such a threat to have a tissue box on the nightstand by a lamp, wouldn't there be signs posted about it everywhere? And then lastly, distress tolerance techniques for DBT. This can be helpful when facing unexpected triggers. If they have a tendency to dissociate when a suds jumps to 10 unexpectedly, they can incorporate just various grounding techniques to stay connected to the moment using their five senses to anchor themselves. Okay, last section here, transitioning to outcome data. Across the, the last two years, we have worked with five patients suffering from OCD at the extreme level. The cohort includes one male and four females with the average age of 47, the average diagnosis of 28 years. And the OCD subtypes have included contamination, both emotional and physical, the need to know and remember, and the fear of harm. And participants were all deemed treatment refractory due to a history of six failed medication trials and two ERP treatments. All participants tolerated the combined accelerated week of treatment, and there was actually a reduction in symptom severity across the five days. Um, previously mentioned, the Y box reduces by 35% or more. That's when it's deemed effective. Our cohort of five patients, all but one had a significant reduction higher than 35% and the average Y box reduction across the five participants was 46.2%. Here is a breakdown of the average Y box score before and after the accelerated week. Symptom severity shifted from extreme to moderate, which is really, really substantial. And the outcome data that has been continued to collect for the individuals who did offer us six weeks post-accelerated week, we have noticed symptom severity continues to reduce, even from day five of accelerated week to um, six weeks out, still symptom reduction is happening. Um, regarding the vignette I introduced earlier, I'd like to show just a quick um, progression of her work through photos. So the exposure started with just a folded napkin under a lamp. This is actually even more advanced, but um, this was at the hotel. And so we have, what she would typically do is move that napkin, also the magazine underneath, probably inch the lamp away from the wall and then move the curtain. So nothing was near it. And so the very start of her exposure entailed, let's keep the napkin where it has been placed right under the lamp. And then you can see by the end, we're progressing and inching things very close to the lamp and the bulb. And then finally, an incorporation of all the hazards she identified. So I wanna show you this video. This is a video of my office. And when you walk in, we have first just a tipped over heating fan and then unplugged baby monitor. So she can't hear her child. Then you have fire hazards by the toaster, choking hazards. We left this all overnight as well. An open uh, a, a pill bottle and then a towel over an extension cord. What I like about this video is it serves several purposes. First, she set up the scene. So it held her responsible for the fire starting at Mount Sinai if it were to happen. And she also continued to watch this content during her TMS sessions of receiving the active stimulation. What we have concluded so far is that accelerated ERP plus TMS shows equal, if not more effectiveness compared to just standard ERP or TMS in isolation. I also believe it illustrates the impact of ERP and how therapy can continue to play a central role for these individuals with severe to extreme OCD. Of course, there are some limitations such as the small sample size, the absence of control conditions, and limited data right now to reflect long-term efficacy of symptom reduction. So within the future, our hope as a team is to develop, to develop treatment arms across the accelerated five-day course, including accelerated treatment of TMS in isolation, ERP in isolation, and then the combined TMS with ERP. Here's a final slide, just I'd like to take a moment to highlight our team and the number of individuals it takes to make the accelerated week happen. It's a breakdown of our team, including our psychiatrists, who are very, very um, knowledgeable of OCD across so many neuromodulation services, um, TMS technician, research coordinator, neuroimaging, and also admin. 
All right. Thank you. All right, Dr. O'Neill, wonderful. <laughs> so I'm just going to hide some people here. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. It was really, really interesting uh, for me as well as everyone else, I'm sure, who are here. Just a reminder for anybody who wants to ask a question of Dr. O'Neill now, you can put your question into the Q&A section and we will read them to Dr. Mm -hmm. O'Neill. She'll answer them. If you're interested in asking the question yourself, you can raise your virtual Zoom hand and after written questions, we will bring you on to ask your question. All right, Dr. O'Neill, you have your first question from uh, Julia Erhan. Uh, thank you for a wonderful presentation. I was wondering if there were challenges to engaging individuals in such an intensive treatment. Always, <laughs> yes, great question. I. Oh. I mean, I, I mentioned it a little bit within the um, presentation. What I love about exposure is that it helps meet the patient where they are. Um, if the individual is really wanting to start at a very slow pace, um, it's not gonna serve us to jump into the deep end of the pool. So we really will try to find the shallow end for them and start, I typically start at maybe a four on the hierarchy. And we work really, really hard to identify different ways that they feel like they're going to be successful. To formulate exposures, um, I often check in with the patient if they feel like this is something that they that they deem they could be successful in completing. And if they say no, then we got to keep working. We get we need to find a variable. We need to continue to make it at a level that still gives them distress but at a level that they feel confident and comfortable completing. Um, so it's a lot of discussion, a lot of trial and error, um, and, and can take quite some time, which is why we certainly start before the week of treatment. Thanks for that, Dr. O'Neill. Uh, you have one comment from an anonymous attendee. Great job. That's all. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> thank <laughs> you. <laughs> Hi, Christina, you have something for us? I do. I have a question. Um, so this was so cool, first off. Um, really, just really neat to see what exactly you do um, to help these patients. And um, just because I see a lot of folks together, we actually see OCD, like deep brain stimulation cases who have tried but failed ERP, TMS. Um, from your experience, are there any predictors, like any patient traits, any OCD themes mm -hmm. that might help identify who's going to kind of be best to respond to this kind of treatment versus not? Oh man, that's such a great question. I feel like I don't have enough patient participation yet to know fully. Um, however, the individuals who are signing up for this um, are not necessarily low in motivation or um, passive in their care. And th there's this is certainly um, what they would call a boot camp and not a restful week. Um, so for the individuals showing up and committing to this work, that takes a different level of, of motivation. And I think that's always a really good sign. What I do notice of individuals, at least going into deep brain stimulation, is they'll often say within their self-report, everything is a 10. I can't distinguish anything on my hierarchy that could be less. And it's really hard for going back to the first question that was asked to identify anything that can budge or be flexible in any way. And so um, what I at least see and know about the individuals going through DBS is that they will really start to struggle with exposure, not respond to it, and feel as though there's no range in their severity of how they can work with exposure. If that's the case, I typically look for that post-programming of DBS to begin exposure. Mm -hmm. When they start to tell or notice for themselves that I can now see a range and I can see there's different severities or different ways that I can approach certain things versus others. That type of flexibility in their mind through stimulation can give the green light for exposure to come back. Um, that's what I typically wait for. So interesting. 
It's Thanks fun. For question, Christina. <laughs> <laughs> Coming on. Um, anything else, Christina? We have a couple more in the in the Q and A here. Christina, you back? No, I'll let you take over this. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, Dr. O'Neill, uh, you have a question from Angela Rico Bono. Is an fMRI ever done after the completion of treatment to see if it looks different than the pre-treatment fMRI? Oh, that's such a great question. I, um, I, I, this would probably be better for the psychiatrist. They follow more of the fMRI. Um, but I believe not. Um, I think it would probably take a grant with some money to be able to do that. However, um, so many patients are actually interested in that and have asked that same question. They want to see the different circuitry. They want to see if there's an impact in a different way. Um, I don't believe, at least with TMS, that right now that there is a post-accelerated fMRI, but would be a great part of a study for sure. Okay, great. Thanks for that. Mm -hmm. um, you have a question from David Dorfman. Are there any data on the long-term benefit of the treatment, uh, for example, one to two years post-intervention? For the accelerated week, unfortunately, not right now, just because we're so short-term. Um, and it's really hard to collect data from individuals, especially who are, some have come in internationally or other places outside of um, New York State. And so um, to continue following with them is a little hard as, as the clinical team. Um, so all the more reason, I think that's one of our limitations right now. Uh, what I do know from research with the isolation of ERP, um, the isolation of TMS and the combined ERP with TMS um, at the six week course, all of those have suggested really great long-term um, symptom reduction sustaining over time. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, mm -hmm. Here's a question from Shilpa Tofik. Excellent presentation and very impressive work you're doing. Are there times when interventions need to be carried out with potentially enabling family members? Yes, yes. <laughs> you guys are spot on <laughs> with all of this. <laughs> I have um, frantically worked. It seems like this is always like a um, a growing development with this treatment that each time I do a new case, I'm developing another handout um, because there's always a new part of the case that we want to better inform. And um, what I'm doing right now is not only in between with action plans, but also the final day will zoom in a, a family member who they're typically really close to and are willing to work with them. And we'll start educating that individual on what reassurance seeking looks like, how they can look for information gathering versus reassurance seeking, because that's usually the ritual held by um, family members to assist unknowingly. And of course, with the best of intentions, over accommodating um, with any ritual and trying to do shortcuts for the individual to, to, to make life easier. And so with collaboration of the patient, um, we'll have a joint session and really get the other individual on board and send them home actually with a personalized action plan for uh, post-accelerated week. What are some strategies to go into and reincorporate at their home so that they have a plan of all the exposures they want to tackle, especially if they're staying at a hotel in between um, the accelerated week. Thanks for that. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, I have a, a, a semi-related question. Oh, Lisa. Hi, Lisa. Hi, I'm okay. back. We got, we got um, guest, so guest uh, speakers here. What, what have you got for us, Lisa? Yeah, so I have a question. Um, as someone who doesn't do a lot of ERP, this may sound kind of naive, but I'm thinking of one of my patients who takes very little to go into a panic attack. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if ever um, somebody sort of overestimates their fear hierarchy and overshoots it and gets extremely anxious where habituation has the, you know, you don't have habituation yeah. instead it escalates. Does yeah. that happen? Um, and, and how do you deal with it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I have, I have several responses to that. One is that what we notice within neuromodulation, there's this phenomenon with psychiatric treatment that there's this rough patch within neuromodulation post stimulation that it's almost like their brain is rewiring or having a, have a, having a difficult time initially getting through things. And um, 
post DBS, eight weeks out with major depression, we see a rough patch for individuals. I would say within the Tuesday of TMS, I see sometimes a, a rough patch. First, they're coming in Monday with adrenaline and ready to go. Then we may have paced ourselves too quickly. And Tuesday seems like it's a rougher day um, before getting back on and, and moving through. So typically some individuals will, we might go to the deep end too fast. And um, that is certainly something that we discuss, we process, we really start to scale back and continue to collaborate. Um, I have an individual who actually her feared consequence was this will result in a panic attack. And so there's a lot of like behavioral experiments to work with an individual to um, not only engage and see if that feared consequence is so, is, shows up for them, but also I, I know I mentioned in vivo and imaginal exposure, I'll bring in interoceptive exposure and we'll do exposure to those physiological symptoms so yes. that we're targeting that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're, you're saying these are things you might anticipate because the patient might have a history of panic exactly. attack or fear of a panic attack. Yeah, yeah. But you haven't had that happen out of the blue where... Someone... Not not within my accelerated week, no. Okay. No. Um, there is some moments that they feel like maybe they've gotten, it's become too significant. It didn't induce a panic attack, but it was a very big exposure and we'll do things for distress tolerance in that moment to mm -hmm. scale it back down. So we'll okay. do some grounding. We'll do balancing on one foot. We'll try to like re um, regain reality in that moment. And then you'll cease the um, exposure and then re kind of calibrate. And then always return. Yeah. Yeah. And then return yeah. and then return always at, make at sure a four instead of a seven or something. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, one other point. Um, in terms of the question about fMRIs, um, don't you have fMRI data for every uh, DBT treatment? DBS. Um, D I'm sorry, I meant TMS. 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 Treatment. We have it pre TMS. Mm -hmm. Um, we just I don't think we have the we're not doing it at every session. Okay. Yeah, we're not doing it um post to see to see the transition across the. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. All right. Primarily getting it for their specific target. Just the initial in the initial. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks for popping in, Lisa. Uh, Dr. O'Neill, looks like you've got one more question in the Q&A here from David Dorfman. Okay. Uh, can the expense of the intervention be covered by healthcare insurance? Oh, man. Yeah, that's a great question. There is one insurance, and I'm going to butcher... There's um, not for ERP, unfortunately. Um, unfortunately, all all treatments right now or all um, insurances right now are saying one hour a day, um, we're reimbursing not 40 hours in a week. So unfortunately, that is out of pocket. I believe um, I could figure out what the insurance is, but there is a movement with TMS and the movement for acceptance of um, the accelerated week. Um, I want to say it might be Aetna, or that's one that is working towards coverage of it. Okay. Across the six-week course, it's pretty, um, there's there's quite a lot of coverage um, for just standard TMS, of, of course, especially UMR. And we actually have a lot of UMR patients go through the traditional six-week TMS course. Okay. Uh, well, we are inching close to our time here, Dr. Ronan. I do want to make sure that anyone who is interested in reaching out to you or has more questions or wants to send you referrals, knows how to reach you. Yes. I'd like to put your email in the chat. Yes. I'm going to send this to everyone right now. Thank you so much. All right. That is in the chat for everyone. I haven't even had it, but I'm copying, pasting it for myself. Too. Yeah. So, <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I think we ought to wrap it up here. Thank you so much for your talk today, Dr. O'Neill. Very mm -hmm. interesting. Generated a lot of inquiry and discussion. Um, uh, to attendees, thank you for joining us at Psychology Grand Rounds. And um, you are welcome back on October 4th for our next monthly talk. And um, for psychologists, make sure if you are interested in CE credit to follow that link that's in the chat. And I think that is it. So thanks again, Dr. O'Neill. Thank you. Have a good month. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Oh, thank you.